that we can discuss afterwards. I also have like 17 questions. Mm -hmm. There's going to be enough coffee today. Thank you very much uh, for all your questions and for the uh, discussion. I will move to uh, uh, Alma Hackman, who has just received a PhD. Uh, He's an assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in the history department. A dissertation entitled Radical Nationalists, Moroccan Jewish Communists, 1925-75, explores Jewish engagement in Morocco's national liberation movement through the Communist Party as a way of examining Moroccan Jewish visions of citizenship and independence Morocco. Alma is interested in the intersections of transnational Jewish history and in questions of leftist Jewish politics since and other nationalism. She has co-authored an entitled Pact in 12 Cases, the Alliance of the Israelite and the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, uh, Jewish Social Studies, and uh, has written uh, about Edmond del Male, the literary executive. And she will speak today about the Republican betrayal she and the politicization of Moroccan Jew. Thank you very much, and thank you so much to the organizers. Um, I can't imagine a more wonderful opportunity to meet all these people from a variety of international contexts as well as United States scholars, so thank you for that opportunity. I'm going to skip completely over the paper that I actually submitted with him <laughs> in advance because it dawned on me that this is a uniquely wonderful crowd and that I don't have to spend a long time explaining what is Vichy and what, is, um, what happens in Morocco and all that, and I can kind of cut to a more specific case. So what I want to talk about is a section from the second chapter of the dissertation. And I'm going to talk more about Edmond Amran and Mane, actually, um, and his literary treatment of the Second World War and Jewish experiences there. He was a prominent member of the Moroccan Communist Party, and in fact was the de facto Secretary General when Aliyato was in exile um, for some time. And theoretically, he left because he didn't like its Stalinism, but it's more likely that he left the party due to a lack of official recognition um, for his involvement. So, Intermoor Morocco was a home to a diversity of political refugees, notably those of the Spanish Civil War. On the eve of the Second World War, and especially after France fell to Germany, Casablanca, and Morocco more broadly, served as both a safe haven and a transit point. As disenfranchised European Jews fled hostile fascist regimes and anti-Semitic legislation, the Moroccan Jewish hosts turned from beneficiaries to benefactors. However, when Vichy anti-Semitic legislation was applied in France's colonial buildings, this dynamic shifted. The French betrayal of all that the Alliance Israelite Universelle had inculcated and protectorate authorities had promised marked a watershed moment for Moroccan Jewry. Pre-existing debates among Moroccan Jews regarding their place in their homeland intensified, as did their fears and their hopes. The Vichy period was crucial for the political galvanization of Moroccan Jewry. It manifested itself in many different political directions, most notably Zionism and communism. Some Moroccan Jews joined the prevailing mainstream Istiklal party, but not many. Further, there were many more Jews, likely a, min a majority, who could claim no hard and fast political ideology, but observed alternately alarming and promising events leading to their ultimate choices, socially, politically, and geographically. Overall, the prismatic nature of Jewish political possibilities in the interwar period began to steadily narrow into distinct political organizations and a stark choice to remain in Morocco or to leave, either for France or, more commonly, for Israel. Edmond Amran and Malé was one affected by the sweeping changes brought about by the Second World War. Al Malé is important for his involvement in the PCM during the struggle for national liberation. He was another emblematic Moroccan Jew politicized by the war into the Communist Party. Al Malek was born to a relatively well-to-do Moroccan Jewish family in 1917 in the Atlantic coastal city of Safi. Following the conclusion of the Second World War, he held a leadership position in the PCM's Politburo. He would eventually leave the PCM for a mixture of political and personal reasons. At the age of 63, living in Paris since 1965, Amali picked up the pen and began a prolific career as a semi-autobiographical novelist. 
His characters float between personas, often representative of different segments and epochs of Moroccan Jewish society and history. His 1986 novel, Milan, Un Jour, begins somewhat incongruously with a Jewish man, the protagonist, Nassim, in Morocco looking at a photograph of a dead child in Lebanon. This photograph serves as a Proustian Madeleine, and the reader is jolted into several different intervals of the Moroccan Jewish past, simultaneously touching and intersecting vectors in a grand narrative tesseract. One of these moments is 1933, when Hitler rose to power and the news media shockwaves spread to North Africa. On, quote, some day of some month that's difficult to pin down, certainly a Thursday in 1933, Nassim goes to a local restaurant, Morgan's, where he regularly meets his friends, which include many European settlers. Nassim does not keep kosher and looks with disdain on the, quote, pious and traditional Jewish community, a community in which his family has a long history for producing notable rabbis, for he is an évolué, a Moroccan Jew thoroughly educated and acculturated to France. The table conversation turns to Hitler, quote, something that happened over there in another universe, end quote. And Malé paints a vignette that encapsulates much of the évolué identity. I'm going to have several prolonged quotes, so bear with me. I'll try to give it a more dramatic reading. Um, Hitler, how funny, said de Bergerac with a humor that this time irritated his companions. Don't believe it, old boy, said Mr. Engrand with all seriousness. Nassim listened without saying anything. It all struck him as being very far away. At the Alliance Israelite School, the only education had been that of French history. At the exit exam, the cold and distant examiner, conducted by a very haughty woman, questioned Nassim, pale and shaking with nerves, about taxis in the Marne. This was history, and Nassim no longer remembered where his history book was, in which there was only one black and white illustration, that of a poilu, a first world war soldier, or something like that. But Nassim liked the image, and it distracted him from the boredom of his lessons. Don't you see, Mr. Enfant said to Nassim, to whom he continued to speak in the formal vous form, despite a long old friendship, don't you see what's happening in Germany is very bad for you Jews. Drink, drink, shouted Morgan and Petit Buron, who were not inclined to cast a pall over this merry meal among friends, a concentrated form of this small colonial society into which Nassim had been admitted, but without fully participating. He had been well assimilated, but he held on to a deep difference that he himself still didn't fully grasp." End quote. Nassim, a product of the Alliance and surrounding himself with European, distinctly non-Jewish friends, cannot escape an abiding sense of alienation. The obvious understatement, what's happening in Germany is very bad for you Jews, highlights Nassim's alterity, you Jews. Emelé writes Nassim to be dimly, but perhaps increasingly conscious of the fact that his gallicizing Alliance education his perfect French, his disdain for, and even abandonment of his, quote, traditional Jewish background, has left him somewhat stranded. Jewishness comes to the fore and challenges Nassim's French identity further with the arrival of European, Yiddish-speaking Jewish refugees in Morocco, as well as the rampant increase of anti-Semitic propaganda distributed by European settlers in Morocco, well before the installation of the Vichy government. And Malé's depiction of such anti-Semitic propaganda clashes tragically with images of French assimilated Jewish women, quote, corseted, their hair in chignon, the mirror image of French women, end quote, forced by an abrupt attempt in the politically acceptable air to, quote, change partners as in a dance. Nassim is not politicized by these experiences, but rather forces through this segment of the narrative in a confused state, unsure of his place in society. He describes one friend, another Moroccan Jew, Masoud, as being remarkably, impressively politically active, another long book. No Jew ventured into politics. No one joined an activity about which we knew nothing and which could bring trouble. Better to remain Jewish without history, separated from everything, like the authorities, the friendly paternalism of the French entourage pushing you imperatively to do so, a blue shirt and red tie, a certain Masoud, a petty worker from a poor family, regarded with a certain distance by the Jewish community aristocracy. Masoud, thus dressed, went to Casablanca one day. They say he went to attend a meeting, that he sold a newspaper in the city streets, even that he got into a fight with some Frenchmen, something extraordinary. Nassim didn't wear any particular color or any external sign. He disliked any ostentation, but he harbored many ardent political beliefs, which were not settled on any one program and didn't amount to any particular activity. 
Nassim's confusion is met with decisiveness in the broader Jewish communal setting. While Jews, quote, don't do politics in this world, and Mali depicts cracks in the perceived apolitical Jewish atmosphere. First, through characters like Masoud embracing leftist political activism, and then through the synagogues. And Mali depicts the Jews of Safi as perplexed as to how exactly best channel their feelings to Jewish solidarity for European refugees. Quote, no one knew a single word of Yiddish in the Safi community, and it wasn't even certain that our two extraterrestrials, they had received two German and Jewish members in the community now, which they referred to as extraterrestrials, knew how to speak it, but they could speak more or less German sounding words. Only Ruben knew a little bit, end quote. The only reason why Ruben knew any Yiddish was because he had read an imported Zionist magazine and had come to identify Yiddish with Zionism rather than Hebrew. This is an interesting and rel revelatory detail considering El Mali's critical <coughs> perspective on Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Midrahi, any permutation thereof, relations in North Africa and the Middle East, especially after Israeli statehood in 1948. Ruben, another emblematic character for El Male, works for this local Zionist paper. His primary job, Nassim explains, is to correct the Ashkenazi magazine director's French. This enigmatic character of the Ashkenazi writer remains a vaguely threatening outside force, quote, about whom we knew nothing. Nassim likes to tease Ruben about the Zionist paper and relates that he, quote, didn't understand why Ruben devoted himself so much to that paper. For he had read about Herzl, the miracles performed by the settlers in Palestine and all about Kibbutzim, and was still not persuaded. With the arrival of European Jews in Safi, as well as more numerously in places like Casablanca, the sacred bonds of solidarity, about which Lisa Moses Leff has written, were inverted. Where European Jews had been the benefactors for downtrodden, quote, Oriental Jews of North Africa and the Middle East, Moroccan Jews, as well as Jews in other North African and Middle Eastern contexts, now found themselves in the role of benefactors rather than beneficiaries. This was both empowering for Moroccan Jews as well as simultaneously distressing. Increasingly, their Jewishness was to be their central identity. Jewish and Moroccan identification rather than, quote, French, was accelerated with Vichy's anti-Semitic legislation in the country. The two German Jews in Safi became symbols of political and cultural isolation and an alienation for El Malay. Quote, exile wasn't elsewhere. The return consummated in beginning again the spiritual quest. The two German Jewish refugees had thus arrived, enigmatic beings upon reflection, passing signs written into the landscape, withdrawn from the daily back and forth. Hitler. As Moroccan Jews were compelled to leave protectorate schools and jobs, positions as cinema owners, doctors, lawyers, and merchants, local Jewish institutions, such as the Alliance, became overburdened with joint responsibilities to Moroccan and European Jews. Further, Jewish political refugees represented yet another kink in the Vichy political atmosphere. Labeled political undesirables, they were interned in forced labor camps built to fulfill the long-standing colonial vision of a Trans-Saharan railroad that would effectively transport and mine Morocco's phosphate-rich regions for the metropole. In the prisoner population, largely communist, the Vichy authorities had the cheap labor to accomplish this goal. Moroccan Jewish fates intertwined intermittently, yet increasingly, with those of Eastern and Central Europe, as well as Moroccan Jewish protégés who claimed European passports. A certain David Gabay was arrested in January 1940 and sentenced by a military tribunal in Casablanca to 22 months in prison for distributing political propaganda alongside Spaniards and other undesirables. He was born to Moroccan Jewish parents in Casablanca in 1915 and acquired British protection. His fate, and those of many Moroccan Jews, complicates historical understandings of colonial legal definitions such as European, Moroccan, or even Israelite, and they defy generalization. Along with political undesirables, European Jews fleeing the continent were similarly unwanted. Resident General Nogas, about whom we've heard a lot today, in conjunction with orders from Vichy, frequently bemoaned their presence on Moroccan shores. Estimate var estimates vary as to initial numbers. 800 to 1,000 is a frequent figure quoted by Vichy authorities in January of 1941. Often already, quote, armed with visas for overseas French, overseas French, sorry, I skipped a lot of, I was hacking this chapter apart. <laughs> Ignore that last <laughs> sentence. By 1944, <laughs> um, the Vichy period in Morocco had drawn to a formal close. An official protectorate report concluded, quote, 
but the many difficulties that surrounded them have revealed a great malaise within the Jewish communities, in particular in the most important centers such as Casablanca, Rabat, and Meknes. This malaise is nothing more than the logical conclusion of a number of currents running through the Jewish communities. These currents were already noticeable in the pre-war years. The Vichy years and the Gallic betrayal that accompanied them left the Moroccan Jewish community, particularly the urban politicized elites, shaken and vulnerable. Further, it discouraged politically motivated Moroccan Jewry away from France and into the arms of Zionist or nationalist leftist policies. One indication of the economic, political, and psychological strain of the period is reflected in the special autumn Purim the Jews of Casablanca celebrated upon the Allied landings from 8 to 11 November 1942, as well as by Muslims in the popular and cynical song by Hussein Slawi, Marika, and Chris Silver is here. If you want to talk to him about that, he specializes in that kind of thing. Anti-Semitic Vichy legislation served to politicize Moroccan Jews, building on a pre-war legacy of universalist activism against racism and anti-Semitism through Lika and many other groups. Oh no. Um, the, the PCM appealed to a wide swath of the Moroccan Jewish political landscape and welcomed the, enti quote, the entire Moroccan population, regardless of race, language, or religion. This held great appeal for many Moroccan Jews, particularly the elites, that were often educated by left-leaning alias educated teachers. While some Moroccan Jews embraced Moroccan nationalism through the lens of communist universalism, many more embraced Zionism and its ideology of circling the wagons against those that would attack their Jewish brethren. The vast majority of Moroccan Jews remained outwardly politically neutral or Zionist. The immediate post-war period proved the heyday of Moroccan Jewish participation in the PCM. They represented a crucial, powerful, and symbolic minority of a minority. For those Jews engaged in Morocco's national liberation movement, the PCM was the most productive and inclusive avenue of participation. In addition to the PCM's less than entirely effective literacy programs, Participating in the PCM's activities was itself a kind of school, according to another communist Jewish activist, Simon Levy. He once wrote, for many Jews, the PCM was a crucible of solidarity in the struggle. The democratic appeal after the war put in motion latent forces. When independence became a concrete goal, the PCM offered clear answers for minorities and brought them into labor and political action. It is clear that the PCM represented one very distinct and persuasive political option for Jews contemplating what it would mean to be a Moroccan Jewish citizen in the newly independent nation state. I have one, one two minutes left. Four, okay. Edmond Amran and Male spoke of his <coughs> engagement in communist politics in a series of interviews with Marie Ledonnet. In one revealing exchange, Ledonnet asks El Male what persuaded him to join the PCM when so many other Jews began to pursue Zionism. His answer speaks volumes. Quote, three elements are essential to answering this question, place, time, and identity. Time, this was the climate of 1945, which came with the fantastic foundational myth of communism. I was one of the thousands of human beings swept up by this myth. I now think that the communi communist experiment was something magnificent. Indeed, in terms of the imaginary and the existential, it was an explosion of all borders. We were there in a kind of aurora borealis, a kind of birth, end quote. Amale refers to the boundless optimism that communism and the USSR, as its victorious emblem, represented upon the conclusion of the Second World War. As a young man, the Allied victory and the promises of communism appealed to El Malé and many other French-educated, philosophically-minded Moroccan Jews. El Malé would eventually abandon the PCM, but in the 1940s and 1950s, he described his engagement as a kind of seduction. El Malé's initial activism was located at a fiat garage in Casablanca, a site El Malé uh, continually references in his semi-autobiographical fiction. Here, there were, quote, large meetings of Europeans, Frenchmen, and Spaniards, excluding Moroccans. This constituted the embryonic state of the Communist Party. I went there, seduced by people that I found to be kind. The friends I had in my youth weren't part of it. I was in the process of distancing myself from them. It was a solitary choice. And Mali doesn't intimate whether his friends are predominantly Jewish or not, but he clearly considers his politically, political activity to be isolated. In the same series of interviews, he describes himself, his life as an allegory for those Moroccan Jews who participated in the party. 
somewhat isolated but a minority of a minority, and with profound optimism for their future in their home country and for their universalist message of communism. His language of seduction becomes clearer when he talks of being a young, naive man in the fiat garage, requisitioned by Italians, who found himself, quote, surrounded by pretty, seductive young women in ambiance of brotherhood. He actually elaborates for a long time on the pretty, seductive women for his primary reason of joining the party, but he has more serious things as well. As El Mali became increasingly engaged in the PCM's activities, including becoming a member of the Politburo, he switched from a seduction into a more theoretical, philosophically engaged mode with Marxist writings. Amale, despite his perceived isolation, was one of many in his predicament. So, to conclude, despite the Allied landings and the Anglo-British occupation of Morocco, the Vichy administration remained temporarily untouched. For those Jews who would engage in communist politics, this seemed to double the betrayal of the French Republican ideal. Further, attacks on Jews by European Vichy supporters continued in spite of the official conclusion of anti-Semitic legislation. Abraham Sarfati, another prominent Moroccan Jewish communist, has said on this matter, quote, more than one Jew was arrested by the police and thrown in prison for having invited an American soldier to his home, or for only having engaged in conversation with one on the street. In some respects, the political options persuasive to Jews had become more limited. Communism and Zionism appeared to be the more, quote, realistic options in this context. In others, the political scene was infinitely more complicated and disruptive. Between the nationalists, the Americans, the French allegiance to the, and allegiance to the Sultan, Zionism, as well as the Communist International, the waters of Moroccan Jewish political identification and allegiance were increasingly muddied. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alma. And questions, comments? So I'm interested, what relationship did they have, especially after you know, 1944, the communists, and more specifically, Jewish communists towards the nationalist movement and towards the Sultan. I mean, you mentioned a little bit, but it's a short talk. Right. So, I'd be more interested in what the large engagement with Moroccan politics was, and against it, you know, they influenced Zionism, but what exactly did that mean? Did they even talk about the nationalist movement? They ignored it? Did they dislike it? Were they indifferent? And then, like, the communist members? Yeah, the, com the, the communists in general, I mean, specifically, like, Jewish Moroccan yeah. communists rather than uh, the European. Yeah, I mean, they were very interested in the nationalist movement, very much so. I mean, there's a profound shift that occurs even within communist politics directly after the Second World War. You have the first, well, he is Moroccan at this point, but an Algerian Jew refounds the Moroccan Communist Party, actually in the midst of the final battles of the Second World War, basically. And thereafter, the party engages in a long process of Moroccanization. And in 1946, begins an official path as a national liberation party. So what ends up happening to grossly generalize the Moroccan Communist Party and the Jewish members within it tried very, very ardently to court the nationalists and Istiqlal and try to work with them to, to be rebuffed on several different occasions. There are a few instances of overlap and um, corroboration, these sorts of things, but most often the PCM was kind of left alone within that because it was viewed as not essentially Moroccan in the same way. It was very suspicious for those reasons. Thank you. We'll just collect again. Uh, next one is Lutz. Well, thank you very much. It was really a really fascinating paper. And I wonder, could you say something? Could you describe like, the arrival of the East European Jews mm -hmm. in Morocco, coming from uh, Spanish Civil War? And mm -hmm. Could you say something about the effects that had uh, like uh, the first knowledge about the Holocaust and Jewish communists in Morocco mm -hmm. and how it shaped their self under or yeah, shaped their self understanding like after they really received knowledge what happened in Europe and also what happened to uh, Jewish communists in Europe mm -hmm. because they were obviously very much shaped. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Alma. I, I, one of the things I I like about this project and this paper is for you as a historian how you're trying to engage literature and literary work as part of rethinking and reinterpreting this period of modern history. And I think you're, it is, I think you're also uh, one of the other things when you look at the works of, of Edmond Amrani Mada is how he himself thinks that how this is important. 
So when you look at Saud Abul Haki in Arabic, which is trans, it's really about oral history and writing history, but not writing history for academia. He, he was very conscious about the public, how as historians we should engage the general public. And, and, uh, and I think that's really something that you did really a great job in, in how you try to engage the, the big question, but also in a very malicious way. So I, do that. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a, I think we need, I, for me as, a, as, a, as, a, as an anthropologist, I think historians have to think about this really open source and also look at the, uh, not only Edmond and Merah and Safati, but also other ordinary Jews who have written their own autobiographies and how we can use them as also, not only as primary sources in, in reinterpreting and reading this part of the history. Um, well, Omar almost took the words out of my mouth. I was very, I was going to say something. Well, I will still say, um, but I, I, I unfortunately not don't know very much about Morocco, so I was I'd never heard of the particular writer in question. So I was, I was hoping you might be able to tell us a little bit what tell me because I don't know more about who more where you said he was born in Morocco, but where was he writing? He was writing in Paris. He was writing in Paris. In Sullivan post exile. Okay, so he returned. He was so returned. curious he about he the later. scene within which yeah. he was writing. To what extent, like the French literary scene mm -hmm. and historical scene, mm -hmm. and he was writing like the 70s, 80s. 70s. Yeah. Like this is like you know, like the memory of Vichy, the memory of the occupation is exploding at this time yeah. in France. So this, to some degree, might have, I, I imagine, would have affected, um, affected his, his his literary sort of purview. Yes. And if you could perhaps comment on that, and also his choice, it was a choice to write in French. No. I don't know. I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have just maybe we'll have maybe you can answer now and then we'll okay. do another round. Um, okay. <laughs> I can okay. um, David, your question I have to answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so East European Jews. Um, yeah, there's so that's another complicating factor about all this is there are several different kinds and waves of Eastern European Jews that arrive in Morocco from the 1930s or the early 1940s. Um, the first major wave was with the Spanish Civil War. Um, that had been volunteer fighters, and many of them, of course, had been leftists. And when many of them then stay and reside in Morocco, become involved in leftist politics at that point, um, as well as labor union organization. And that's quite different from the two German Jewish extraterrestrials that Amale references in that text. Um, those are definitely World War II refugees. They're not particularly politically inclined in any direction. He writes of them keeping them very much to themselves. Um, so these are very different poles of Eastern European Jewish existence in Morocco, but they're certainly very important for the development of the Communist Party, um, as much as the ones that were already engaged in leftist activism. Um, the second part of your question was knowledge of Actually, the Actually, when I was there, knowledge of the Holocaust, like, which obviously came after the refugees right. arrived, like, like the knowledge really what was, right. what the Holocaust was. Right, so that's what that little cafe tidbit is supposed to be about, sort of, in the sense that there's this huge understatement of what's happening in Germany for you Jews is bad. Um, everyone knows this at that point. Um, but there is a general sense of the Jewish community, even in Safi or Esuira at the time where that conversation is happening, is aware of these influxes of refugees, discussion of dramatic legal changes for European Jewish life. But the extent of the Shoah and those sorts of killings is not something that appears until later. Um, yeah. okay. And Omar. Um, thank you for the nice thing. I enjoyed it. Nice to <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying the truth. I'm not saying yeah. anything back. Well, I did literature studies before I went into history, which is a big explanation for that. So I, I came to this subject through literature as an exile in North Africa, actually. Um, so that's probably why I have more of that then. And then Daniel, you were asking about his context in writing. Well, he's, I mean, it's very much a late wind career.
for him. Uh, he worked in a lot of different journalistic endeavors. In addition to his fiction, he was writing um, a lot on art history about Moroccan artists, musicians, these sorts of things. So it wasn't strictly <coughs> just um, very historically obsessed, circular, sort of semi-autobiographical work. Um, in terms of his, was your question more about his interaction with ongoing historical terms? Sort of. I mean, if he was writing in the 70s, you know, you've got the kind of... The well, he doesn't publish his first novel to leave. Well, even yeah. more so in that case, you know, the explosion of, like, Sheikh Al Lekitir, Paxton's book, like, this right. is a really important context, as you're guessing, you know, right. which he writing. Right. So I'm curious... For the What's his engagement? Yeah. yeah. I, don't I, don't know what his, I don't know what his particular engagement was with that particular literature. I mean, something that I've been able to gather about him is he's very, very interested in keeping the focus on Morocco and the sort of terrible deception that happens to Moroccan Jews if they go elsewhere. I mean, his work is primarily obsessed with deception at large, deception within the Communist Party, deception with Zionism, deception with going abroad. And there are no happy endings or happy understandings in El Malay's work. Um, so, I mean, I don't think he was really engaged in that historiography or that historiographical moment, but maybe I'm not about that. Interpret his own end. His own end in Morocco. Yeah, yeah. I this was how I concluded the dissertation at large. I was comparing him as well as Abraham Serfati and Simon Mouloud's days in Morocco. But the other two who returned to Morocco and they're welcomed as these national heroes and emblems of Moroccan culture and political forward thinking, despite you know, suffering, imprisonment, um, especially under the protectorate, especially Serfati, right, not only under the protectorate authorities, but under Hassan II, that extremely bloody past that you alluded to earlier under Hassan II. It's, it's odd that they become the good Jews. Yeah, they become the good Jews, and they're, I think it's every week when I was in Morocco last year, I would see some news article about them, you know, yeah. still. Someone would think that they were representative of the entire exactly. Jewish community. Exactly, when the entire Jewish community no, actually distances themselves. How many become kosher? Mm -hmm. the, the yeah. Yeah. The most unkosher of people. Yeah. Lionized. Lionized. Yes. Sorry. I was going to say they, they became the, the, the good Jews, but they were never, you know, within the Jew, Jews themselves, they were they were totally outsiders. And I was just, it, it, just, just you'll indulge me in a, in a, uh, a personal recollection with uh, Edmond and all that. Uh, when I, um, I first met him, and you know, the context of my first meeting him was before he wrote his first novel. This was, a, um, this was in, the, in the late 70s. It was actually before I embarked on my research in the Morocco in the, in the Suira. And the reason he was, uh, well, someone sent me to him because of his origins in the Suira, and then he immediately sort of latched onto me with, with great interest me because of this sort of nostalgia. I mean, he was, he was, his, his family came from, uh, from uh, the Suira, and, uh, you know, I had done research on El Males, and I, I had, and then later, you know, as I was doing my research, I had all this sort of genealogical information that he was fascinated with. And, um, you know, of course, in comparing him to Sarfati, of course, Sarfati is rotting in prison at the right. time that, that he's in Paris, uh, you know, writing his, uh, you know, starting to write novels and, and so forth. But he, he, he really, you know, in this period of time, becomes transformed into a kind of uh, national icon. You know, he, he, he was kind of a guru among uh, Moroccan you know, bohemians and artists and writers and the left in general. And, and you see this sort of transformation from being the sort of dissident guru leftist artist who goes back to Morocco and then becomes a national art, art, uh, icon and, you know, in, embraced by the, the monarchy itself as, a, as, as an iconic Jew, of course, who had nothing to do with uh, the Jewish community, even that remained in, in Morocco. So I, I think it's, um, you know, there's sort of a, 
you know, I don't know how much you're going to take this and, you know, because you work on a particular period and then you're, and, but, and then his novel in a sense is, you know, there, there's already sort of identity evolution going on at that, at that time. So. But, but anyway, I was, I, was, I was very, I mean, I thought you did a great job analyzing and weaving, weaving it into the story, so, you know, um, congratulations. <laughs> Well, as you know, we're, we're rather late. I want to say a bit late, but I don't want to lie to you <laughs> yet. We don't know each other well enough, so I lie to you. And <laughs> therefore, we will have to stop now with the questions, and uh, we <coughs> can continue afterwards. We'll have a break afterwards, and we can discuss all the issues. I know there are some questions, and those who want to ask, mm -hmm. you're at the top of my ultimate list. I will never forget you. Uh, first of all, thanks to Mas uh, Alma. Now we will just take a technical uh, break of two minutes so that uh, David could uh, start with the PowerPoint. If you want to go to the bathroom.